Hey, Redeemer family. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Redeeming Truth. My name is John. I'm here with uh, Dr. Farnell, and I'm here with Dr. Bill Roach. We are um, going to talk today about a, an incredibly significant subject, the subject of the Bible and specifically the subject of inerrancy. See, when it comes to the scriptures um, here at Redeemer and, and many other places, uh, we believe in the inspiration of scripture, meaning that the Bible is the word of God, that God is the ultimate source of scripture. And if that's the case, then there's going to be some critical characteristics of scripture that are going to uh, be obvious if God is the author. And one of those is inerrancy. It's not going to have any errors. And so this is a really sticky subject, has been for many years, um, for a lot of different reasons. And we've asked Dr. Roach to come join us today in order to um, in order to help us think through these things on a level that will be helpful, beneficial for all of us. So, so Dr. Roach, will you introduce yourself to, uh, to our listeners? Yes, like he said, my name is Bill Roach, and it's just an honor to be with you today. And I think the reason that we're going to look at this is just the background that God has providentially given me to discuss the inerrancy of Scripture. You know, a very formative time in a person's life are those few years when they leave high school and they're in college and early graduate school. And by God's grace, I was placed really under the tutelage of Dr. Norman Geisler, who was one of the framers of the historic Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, which defined and set out the contours of what evangelicals mean when they actually say the word inerrancy. And through my process with him, I was able to interact with many of the other framers of the Chicago Statement. And one of the results of that is we started to realize that there were a whole host of people who were claiming to follow the doctrine of inerrancy, even the doctrine of inerrancy defined by the Chicago Statement, and yet they were interpreting it contrary to the framers of the Chicago Statement. And that's why we actually published this book called Defending Inerrancy. And the goal is to affirm the accuracy of Scripture for a new generation. And the premise of the book, or the thesis of the book, is that just like the United States Constitution, we shouldn't interpret it contrary to the intention of the framers, so too should we not interpret the Chicago Statement contrary to the intention of the framers. So from that, we, re we really sparked the Defending Inerrancy movement, and that's how Dr. Farnell and I got connected, and individuals at Veritas and seminary and now with redeemer and a whole host of other figures through that movement where we want to champion this doctrine in our day and age so bill can you start us out and just give us a a really easy understanding of inerrancy inerrancy is this idea that whenever god speaks he speaks true truth now the real emphasis there is we understand that god speaks truth but the debate comes down to what do you mean as Schaefer would talk about true truth and what people were starting to do during the 20th century is they were qualifying that was it modified truth modified cognitive truth existential truth qualified historical critical truth and that's why we're trying to say that whenever god speaks he speaks truthfully but we have to add he speaks true truth one that corresponds with reality. So what we're trying to affirm is, is the simple adage that Jesus taught, thy word is truth in all matters that it addresses. That's great. And so you also brought up the Chicago Statement. Can you give people a little bit of historical background on what that is and why it is so important? The background of the Chicago Statement was really birthed from the ministry of R.C. Sproul and Ligonier Ministries. And during the, the early years of Sproul's ministry, he was working with a figure named John Gerstner, who in many ways was the main mentor over R.C. Sproul. And they started to notice within their denomination, people were redefining key terms such as inspiration and infallibility and even this notion of inerrancy. So they started actually having these Ligonier conferences on biblical inerrancy and figures like Gerstner and Bonson and Sproul and others would come together, but they realized this had to be something that was broader than just a conservative Presbyterian movement. It needed to be something where a whole coalition of evangelicals came together to stand firm upon the doctrine of inerrancy because people weren't just – 
denying the inerrancy of scripture within their circles. They were denying it within Baptist circles, Methodist circles, non-denominational circles, and all throughout mainline denominationalism. So what they did is they gathered together in Chicago for three different summit meetings. The first summit meeting focused on giving us what was known as the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, which codified in articles affirmation and denial exactly what we mean when we're trying to define and delimit the doctrine of inerrancy. The second one was the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics, where they also offered affirmations and denials to say what is the proper interpretive method to understand the doctrine of inerrancy. And the reason that's important is because you can affirm a high view of scripture. You can sign a doctrinal statement saying you believe in the inerrancy of scripture and then employ a method or a hermeneutic, an approach to the Bible that completely guts that affirmation of scripture. And we've seen that happen time and time again, where people say, I hold to a high view of scripture, but then they're out using historical criticism or genre criticism or some kind of criticism in order to not just have historical criticism, but historical vandalism upon the text of scripture. And then finally, the third statement was one on biblical application. If the Bible speaks truthfully and we interpret it according to what the Bible delineates as a proper method, then it's going to really apply to our lives and what that might look like. So that was what they were trying to do. And in many respects, they won the battle for their generation. But every generation has to fight the battle of inerrancy because it's one of those things that comes from the flesh, the devil, and the world around us to try to undermine the total truthfulness of God's word. Did he really say Bill, that's super helpful for somebody watching and, and needs to be caught up to speed. What are some of the main attacks going on right now when it comes to um, undermining the doctrine of inerrancy? Well, the most historic attacks that we've seen where people have tried to attack the doctrine of inerrancy that lead into this is we think of people like Robert Gundry or Bob Gundry, however you want to say his first name, where he was using genre criticism to try to dehistoricize the text. So we understand what, what genres are. There are these different types of literature. You've got poetry and you've got narrative and you've got these other sort of maybe apocalyptic literature, people will say. Well, what happens is, is that people start to read all of the literature surrounding the biblical text. So they're looking for literature in Greco-Roman biography or Jewish midrash. And they're saying, see how the people use that genre and see what they did with that genre and see how the Bible tends to match that kind of genre and how they dehistoricize the text. You see, when I come to the biblical text, I've done all of this research as an academic and I see these specific genres that are being used. And it's almost like they have this Gnostic lens. They're reading through the text and then it clicks on and it's, did you see it? Did you see the transition? Did you see the change? Now we can interpret this as midrash and it's not the real words of Jesus, but the made up words of Jesus. I know it says Jesus went here and there and said these things, but he didn't go here or there or say these things. They're just fabrications that have come about. And Norman Geisler and several others within ETS fought that and said, no, whenever God speaks, he speaks truthfully. And whenever God accommodates, he doesn't accommodate unto fallen human genres. He accommodates to our finitude, not our fallenness. God speaks in a way that we can understand, but he doesn't speak in a stuttered, sinful way that bypasses the nature of truth. But don't we see this everywhere today where people are using specific genre criticisms or historical criticisms and they're trying to undercut the total truthfulness of scripture. Now, let me give you an analogy. We use this phrase, a rose by any other name is still a rose. And the reality is, is that genre criticism by any other name is still genre criticism and it guts the historical accuracy of the scriptures. And this is what 
really your co-host here, Dave Farnell, has spent so much of his career doing is engaging figures who have used these types of rhetorical criticism and genre criticism and historical criticism to gut the text of scripture. And that's what we find with the Lycona case or the Bob Gundry case or Daryl Bach and all these other figures that just permeate evangelical institutions. That's super helpful. Dave, do you have anything you might like to add? Yeah, uh, Bill is uh, very much making the important point that inerrancy is tied to meaning, which is not tied to how you interpret. So from the Reformation all the way back to John Chrysostom, the plain normal sense limits the meaning because you have a control when the Bible says God created it in six days and hints at a 24 hour, more than hints at a 24 hour cycle, that uh, plain normal sense in your interpretation limits creativity among evangelical critical scholars. They've attended university and other places where uh, ideas, ideologies can't fit that. So what they've had to do is first use the magic of historical criticism. The magic is it makes the text of scripture moldable. You can play with it. You can create a situation in which the plain normal sense can be become figurative and there's no controls. So what they're doing right now is using hermeneutics that allow for creativity. And now that they've been doing this hermeneutic that allows for creativity, they need to come back and adjust the statement of uh, 1978, 1982, uh, ICBI inerrancy and hermeneutics because they clearly aren't going with the plain normal sense that ICBI talked about. The ICBI limited their interpretation to the plain grammatical historical sense and that anything that relativizes or dehistoricizes would be rejected. The only problem was that doesn't leave much for creativity. And with their influence of the schools that they've been trained at, they've had to start tweaking uh, uh, grammatical historical to historical critical and making uh, certain precepts that allow them to change the interpretation to be much more flexible, much more able to mold so that today they can go into Genesis 1 through 3 and said that the liberals b believe it's poetic fiction, uh, fundamentalists believe it's, it's actual history. They want to strike the middle, as we talked about, to poetic history, meaning that now they're bringing in a less, uh, a less controlled hermeneutic, which is grammatical historical, and they've adopted historical critical. So now they can see things in there that are not in the plain normal sense of scripture, and thereby, oh, all of a sudden we believe in inerrancy, but now the meaning of the text has changed. And I remember hearing Norman Geisler say, if, if the Bible is all allegorical, it can mean anything that you want it to say, and that's what they're doing. They're picking this up in university. They are applying historical critical ideology. They're making the Bible say something that it doesn't say in its plain normal sense. And so in that light, the, the standard normative view of inerrancy has to change. Uh, they're not going to change. The historical critical scholars aren't going to change. They're gonna to have to change the standard of inerrancy because they've stepped away from the only control that we really have and that is plain, normal interpretation of Scripture. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense that we talked about. And this is allowing now for creativity. And when Bill mentioned genre, which means what's the style of literature in the Bible? Suppose you don't like the story of Genesis. We talked about the six literal days today. That is scoffed at by scientism. So what you have to do is apply some form of historical critical ideology and philosophy in there to make it more flexible to say, well, these are long per age periods. Uh, uh, this really isn't, this is more poetic than historical and thereby they mold it now. So they're out now, they have to change uh, 
the statements of inerrancy that were made in 78 and 82 because they're now clearly, it's obvious they're out of step. There's no control. None of these guys agree with much of each other except that they want to change ICBI, and it allows them to read anything into Scripture they want. So for for these guys um, that we're talking about, behind closed doors or maybe after a few drinks what did what do they really think about the framers of icbi and uh the document that they created well they use the appropriate evangelical as i say f word they call them fundamentalists hmm. <laughs> knee-jerk fundamentalists is what i heard yeah, and they, they hmm. want to get rid of them is what they want to do and that's why in many of their classes when you see people giving lectures in these regards, they never attack the doctrine of inerrancy per se, because they know what's going to happen if they do that in the churches of their supporters of their institutions. Right now, the way that they're doing it is they're going to say, we need to have a humble hermeneutic. We need to recognize the conditionedness that comes upon us. And it's been a, a transition away from an emphasis on the text of scripture and they've moved the the notion of the, an objective interpretation of the text to a, a significant focus upon all of the subjective elements in the interpreter. So there's sort of what I call the the three big areas that they'll do this with, sort of in the broad philosophical sense. And we'll say what they are, and then we'll explain what they are. It's ontological conditionedness historical conditionedness and linguistic conditionedness. So what does that mean? Ontology or metaphysics, how things exist. What does it mean to actually exist out there? And we recognize that historically people have realized that to be is to do. What your nature is, how you exist, it's fixed and actions come from that. And we know that to be a dog is to do dog things, to chase cats, to drive your owners nuts when they want to have their food. And to be human is to be a rational thinking being. You can think in propositions and you can speak a meaningful language. But what these guys do is they flip it. Now, instead of to be is to do, to do is to be. Your nature is the culmination of all of the actions in your life. So as all of these existentialists, which that's the existential method, they look at all these different ways that your nature can be conditioned, which means now you're radically subjective given the different circumstances that you've experienced in your life. So then when you read the text, you are fundamentally different. So you're not going to read the text the same way that you read it before. Now you're going to read it as a more enlightened white Western male or a white Western female or whatever kind of thing they can add to it. But the second one is, is that if they can't affect you, they're going to affect your place in history. So now it's historical conditionedness. And how do we bridge the gap from where I live now to the historical author? Because the author's not here anymore, and I'm constantly changing. So you'll hear this word called, we need to have a, a fusion of horizons. And they're going to say, you never actually achieve it. You get closer, but you're always left in this spiral of, your historical and metaphysical things are constantly in flux, they're constantly changing. And then the third one is, is this linguistic idea. And it comes from a lot of postmodernism or deconstructionism, which is the idea that to read a text is to necessarily change the text. So not only are you constantly in flux, but the text is constantly in flux. And people would say, nobody would believe this stuff. Nobody would teach this kind of stuff. Well, one of the main texts that was used at one of the big Southern Baptist seminaries was Janine Brown's book on hermeneutics. And you know what she taught? That exact same approach. Or how many of you have ever heard of the Two Horizons Bible Commentary series? What are the Two Horizons? Existential 
and historical conditionedness trying to merge where you're at and where the original author is at. Do you see where this is coming from? Or you'll see things put out about how we need to have speech act theory approaches where you have what the text says and then what the author meant and also what the effect of the text is. And here's the whole point is they're going to say, I know that the text clearly says this, but the author wasn't in his, his different illocutions, as they would say, is not trying to communicate that intent or that effect so they can change the clear meaning of the text of scripture, hmm. whatever it's propositionally saying, just by going to these unknown intents and these unknown effects to change the meaning of the text. Do you see what this does? It's an approach by which they can use these different methods to completely gut the clear propositional nature of Scripture. So they can say they believe in the inerrancy of Scripture and gut it by the very act of using that in approach to hermeneutics whenever they approach not only that text, but any text, because subjectivity is subjectivity wherever it may be found. So, Bill, what? Uh, so, if someone's hearing all of the wrong ways to do it right now, what would how, how would you talk to somebody and say, okay, what what is the correct way to understand uh, hermeneutics? I think the correct way to understand hermeneutics is we have to make two, or we have to make a distinction between two different things. The first is one of method hermeneutics as as a method by which we're actually going to use a specific approach to the text. And the other one is, is hermeneutics as almost a philosophy. And the interesting thing is, is that they're used interchangeably today. I'm, I'm taking hermeneutics and you go, I don't know what that means today. So as a philosophy, what the Bible teaches is a form of what's known as realism, that God created a real reality, that it's fixed, it's stable, it's not in flux, and that the mind of a human being can actually know it in a true and objective sense because truth is that which corresponds to reality. And if we gut that basic prolegomena issue, we're toast from the very beginning. And we understand what truth as correspondence means. It means whatever the proposition I say, it actually is true if it corresponds to the actual state of affair. So I could say something like, there is a microphone right in front of me. And why is that true? Because it corresponds to the fact that there's a microphone right in front of me. Or as we apply it to the biblical text, it could be something like this. Jesus Christ died upon the cross. Why? Because the proposition that we find in the text of scripture corresponds to an actual reality that's out there. So that's the first step. We have to do away with the existential method that Schaefer warned us about and that the ICBI warned us about. But then the second thing that I would really recommend people to do is to go to the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy and look at the official commentary. And this is what it means to interpret the text. Listen to what they say. We affirm that the text of Scripture is to be interpreted by the grammatico historical exegesis taking account of its literary forms and devices, and that Scripture is to interpret Scripture. Now, notice this denial. We deny the legitimacy of any treatment of the text or quest for sources lying behind it that leads to relativizing, dehistoricizing, or discounting its teachings or rejecting its claims to authorship. And let me just tell you exactly what they mean by that. I'm just going to read what they say because I can't say it any better than them. And this is going to give people a historical document that they can go back and check and see exactly what it's going to look like. So it says this here with the article on interpretation, which is Article 18, touches on some of the most basic principles of biblical interpretation. And this is what it says. Though this article does not spell it out in detail, a vast comprehensive system of hermeneutics. You'd actually have to go to the second statement. It nevertheless gives basic guidelines on which the framers of the confession were able to agree. The first is that the text of scripture is to be interpreted by the grammatical historical exegesis. Grammatical historical is a technical term 
that refers to the process by which we take the structures and time periods of the written text seriously as we interpret them. Biblical interpreters are not given the license to spiritualize or allegorize the text against the grammatical structure and form of the text. Stop right there. Before we finish this, I'm going to ask Dr. Farnell to give us an example of the way some people will use spiritualization and allegorization to go beyond the grammatical structure. But let me finish this paragraph here. It says this, the Bible is not to be reinterpreted to be brought into conformity with contemporary philosophies, but is to be understood in the intended meaning and word usage as it was written at the time it was composed. To hold the grammatical historical exegesis is to disallow the turning of the Bible into a wax nose that can be shaped and reshaped according to modern conventions of thought. The Bible is to be interpreted as it is written, not reinterpreted as we would like to it to have been written according to the prejudices of our own era. So there's a lot there, but the whole point is, is that the Bible means what it says, and it says what it means in its historical and grammatical sense. So how do we interpret it? we got to know what the Bible says grammatically at the time it was written. Well, the basic example of what Bill is talking about is that if you're in a Bible study and the leader of the Bible study will turn and say, well, what does that text mean to you? There is the existentialist relativizing. It doesn't matter what it means to you. It's what God intended it to mean. Now, big picture, I'm always a big picture guy. What we have here is a shift in a view of inspiration that's going on. Suppose I would put on the board the word author in all caps and then underneath it, I'd draw a line, and then underneath, I'd put author in little caps. What we see happening is that there has been a shift in emphasis from all caps author, which is God, superintending his word, so that the writers wrote and recorded without error the words in the autograph, to the focus on the human element. And I've seen more and more evangelical critical scholars going away from the divine, going away from orthodox concepts of inf inspiration to say, well, these were ancients who did the best they could, but in their historical context, they didn't quite have the precision and knowledge that we do. So what they're actually saying is that the human author is more responsible for the text of scripture than God's superintendents. Now, if that's true, then there is no concept of inerrancy. The guarantee of inerrancy in God's word is that God inspired these men without dictation and that he controlled that process so that when they wrote and recorded, they did not make an error in what they were writing. They wrote what God intended, and only God can do this. He didn't violate their uh, personality. He didn't violate their being, but he can do that, and only he can do. So who's in charge of inscripturation now? Is in inspiration, do you see this as a divine document that, yes, though it was written by human elements, God is the spirit of truth, and he's sovereignly guiding them and making sure that what they wrote uh, is what he meant, or do we see now the human element as being really in control and that uh, God kind of uh, uh, here and there may have helped them along, but he left a lot of it to them, and uh, he's not actually uh, involved that much in the process on the lowercase author. And we're seeing this happen, and this is all in line with the fact that not only has there been a shift in, in inerrancy, but there's been a shift in inspiration. How do you view God? What I want to ask these evangelical critical scholars, please tell us, what's your view of God? Is he someone who was in control sovereignly of his word? Or is it like we've gotten into in theology where God is so not in charge anymore uh, that uh, he's left everything uh, somewhat uh, uncontrolled? Uh, he's out, you know, and is God able to guarantee his word. My guess is that they've gone more toward the theo theological position that there's a lot of things that God is either unable or unwilling to be involved in now. Um, I can't think of the name of that 
theology. I'm not a theologian. What's the? It's, there's well, it's deism, process theology. As no, the one where the, uh, open theism. Open theism. I don't yeah. know why that wouldn't come. To and me. that's that's one of the interesting ones. You know, that was actually the second big debate that you look at it is that you know for years people would question the very text itself. You know, the Bible is the word of God, but what you look at with Clark Pinnock and others within ETS, which actually that was what ended up becoming the watershed moment with an ETS and why a lot of evangelicals left was because Clark Pinnock was actually attacking the very nature of God, because it's a very simple idea. God cannot err. The Bible is the word of God. Therefore, the Bible, which is the word of God, cannot err. But and either you're left denying the Bible is the word of God, or you have to affirm that God can err. And right. if you see where people are going with this, there's, there's a simple notion within what's known as the principle of causality. You can't give what you haven't got. And if it's in the cause, it can be in the effect. If it's in the effect, we know it's in the cause. So if God is perfect and God can only do perfect things and God can only create perfect things because he's bound by his nature, then what we're finding is, is that when God created Adam, he created them upright. When God created the Bible, it was without error. And what we find is, is that people are starting to redefine the doctrine of inspiration because they have a God who can fundamentally make mistakes. And they think that's okay. As long as the big picture is all right, or as long as we finish or cross the finish line, it's okay. But that's fundamentally contrary to the God who cannot err or be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And a perfect God isn't one that accommodates unto fallenness and sin. A perfect God isn't a God who forgets or never knew. And that's the whole issue that we're finding with an ETS. And that's why so many of these figures left because an attack on God is the attack on the, the literally the highest being, the God of creation in that regard. What else is left? Seriously. But that's why when we, we look at the notion of inspiration and its correlative terms, infallibility and inerrancy, a lot of times we use them, but we never really point out what we mean. And when we look at inspiration, it means that it's talking about the source of scripture, that it's coming from God. It's not like the authors were inspired, like an individual goes to a concert and they get inspired and they want to go out and march for some cause. Or it's not like a person who wakes up on New Year's Day and they're inspired to go to the gym and start some workout routine. What it means is that the, the origin of Scripture is breathed out by God. And if God is the source of Scripture, then we look at the next two terms, infallibility and inerrancy. And those terms have been really just warlike terms within evangelicalism. A lot of people will, you know, oh, we affirm inspiration according to their definition, but we know what infallibility means. A lot of people first heard the term in relation to something like the Roman Catholic Church and the infallible magisterium, and you'd hear people having to go debate a Jesuit, and they'd shake in their boots being scared, but infallibility refers to the potentiality of Scripture. It lacks the ability to err. And inerrancy refers to the necessary consequent, that it's without error. So if God is infallible and God is perfect, he'll only communicate perfection and he lacks the ability to communicate imperfection. So if God cannot err and God is infallible, the necessary result of the text of scripture is that it's without error. So here's the whole issue the Fuller Seminary case. They said, well, what we want to do is we want to jettison the doctrine of inerrancy, that fundamentalist doctrine, and we want to return back to the infallibility of Scripture. But here's the whole issue, is that their view of fallibility or infallibility was actually fallibility because it allowed for errors in the text of Scripture. So what they meant by infallibility was fallibility, and what they meant by inerrancy was actually errancy. So what we called for in the defending inerrancy movement was a picture of a perfect God that's in 
infallible, according to the classic definition of the term, who necessarily will create a document that is without error in all senses, down to the grammar, the history, and so on and so forth. It's all about how you define the terms, because the first battle is a battle for the dictionary. And then after that, it's a matter of applying that definition to all of your exegesis. So, Bill, it seems like we're, just, we're living in a day where whether it's politics, philosophy, hermeneutics, theology, fill in the blank, there's, a, there's this dialectic going on where there's these conservatives like the ICBI, and they're, they're, they're fighting against something. And then you have these evangelicals now who are in the middle, who are saying, well, we don't want to be the fundamentalists. We don't want to be the liberals. We, we want to be in the middle. And what, what happens is that seems like that, that, that gets painted as the, um, the more rational, the more humble way to view things. And so can you speak exactly. to that? That's exactly what it is. It's considered the more enlightened progressive approach, yes. we might say. And I've given a lecture on this and it's, you know, it comes back to Hegel's dialectic. And, you know, some people question whether Hegel said it for the sake of this, we're gonna just say, Hegel gave us this idea of you got a thesis and antithesis and the necessary progress forward is to meet in the middle. And they're called Mr. Middleman. And, you know, like you're saying, we see it in politics. You can't be too conservative. You can't be too liberal. You gotta meet in the middle somewhere. But let's look at how this, can apply to a whole host of things that are going on out there. What you do is you just, you see the antithesis and the thesis coming together and you just pioneer some road in the middle and you can call it whatever you want, academic sophistication or new research or new insights. When the reality is, is that they're buying into a process definition of truth. Truth is that which is in process, working towards some ultimate final goal. And where we see this coming about evangelicalism the most is in Derek Brown's article at the Gospel Coalition, where he's calling for us in light of new research and new discoveries on many key issues concerning hermeneutics and the texts of scripture to redefine or actually update the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. And the reason that the Chicago statement is under attack is because in many ways, it's the thesis. The liberals are the antithesis, and they want to be seen as the moderate progressive, but they're not going to call themselves moderate progressives, but more as the prestigious, enlightened academic people who see the real middle ground, the real nuances of the issues. And that's where the Gospel Coalition's taking them. And that's where I'm most concerned right now is because they want to go through and literally rewrite every article of the Chicago statement. And Brown did that for his dissertation. So that's one clear example of it. So do you see it as a, um, well, I mean, somebody wa listening to this would be like, well, it's a 40 year old document. Like what's wrong with updating it a little bit? You know, that, that seems like a common sense question. So how would you respond to that? Truth is not measured by time. Truth is timeless. And we could say that about anything if we're going to use chronological snobbery, where we are now at the present time, we're more enlightened than them, we know more than them. And we could see how this just gets permeating throughout, or how it permeates throughout all of scholarship in that regard. So that's one aspect of where people are doing it. Truth, if it's actually true, doesn't change. So here's the real question is, not has modern scholarship changed clearly it has but which doctrine of inerrancy is best represented in the text of scripture and that's one of my big issues with where the gospel coalition's going is that they're giving us all these things about modifications in light of as it says here you know this notion of doctrinal development and it talks about how this notion inerrant and inerrancy weren't used prior to the modern period and this idea is something that's just clothed and cloaked in modernist language. And I go, no, it's not. It's taught in the very texts of scripture. And that's mm -hmm. even what the Chicago framer said. Our view was not based upon rationalistic notions of common sense realism, Scottish common sense realism, put in the time period of B.B. Warfield. Rather, this was the view of scripture 
taught by Jesus Christ himself. Thy word is true. The whole history of the church, um, Geisler did a nice little uh, work on biblical inerrancy, the historical evidence. God's word hasn't changed. Its meaning is fixed. I'll tell you what has changed. Uh, and it's cyclic in history, is where we train our people who inhabit the pews. If we are going for the prestige and honor of men, that's going to subject these young men who will fill our pulpits with ideas that are foreign to the Word of God. And that's what's happening. It's cyclic in history. I told everybody about Dyson Haig who wrote, where they were sending their men in mainline denominations. They picked up these ideas. The story of toy in the Southern Baptist Convention uh, repeats itself. Another thing that we should probably take up is, of course, uh, uh, that uh, book, uh, A Place at the Table, because we need to look at the, I'm going to use the term, psychological dynamic of why this is cyclically happening, and it comes down to, will we be faithful to God's word, or do we want the honor and praise of academic scholarship? Because if you don't use liberal critical scholarship ideology, you will never have a place at the table uh, with them. And there are examples in history, uh, one in a place at the table uh, where one man tried as hard as he could to find a place in recognition. And what was interesting was as far as he went, it wasn't far enough. They never, unless you come wholly over to their left-wing ideology, they will never accept evangelical critical scholars. And I saw one who was questing for Jesus and he read a paper, I think it was at SBL, Society of Biblical Literature. And what was the response? You shouldn't even be involved in this because you, you can't go far enough in what you're thinking. This is what we're facing. We have to have a decision among our training centers. Do we honor God and do we subordinate scholarship to faithfulness? So Dave, yeah. let's let's talk about that on our next podcast because I think that will be an incredible conversation. So Dr. Roach, um, stick around. We're going to have that conversation that Dave just talked about now. For everybody else, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time for Redeeming Truth.